So we have them placed in here. Are there ways that we need to put them in? Yeah, they are. You do have to place them correctly. What you want to ensure is that you have a minimum of at least 12 inches between the carcass and the edge of the pile. And that's important for uh, retaining the heat of the compost and also for trapping any gases and odors that may be formed during the initial stages of composting. Okay. And another thing that we're going to do is we're going to lance the rumen and the uh, thorax of the animals. We need to put at least a small hole in the rumen because the rumen is where the bacteria live that are digesting grass and feed normally. Right. So their byproducts are carbon dioxide and methane basically. So if we do not lance the rumen, since the animal is not eructating or belching out that gas now, then that's just going to... Uh, we'll cause problems it, later. It, well, it could explode. <laughs> well, and that's not good for you. And that's not good for your pile. Yeah. So we're just going to put a small hole into the uh, rumen of each of these animals. And if a person wants to speed the composting process up, they could do a bit more um, rigorous dissection, shall we say. Okay. the pile we just try to pyramid it a little bit make sure we have adequate cover and we want it we really want it to shed rainwater so we don't want any depressions in the top or anything if we trap rainwater then we're just going to get really too wet there so. so just kind of make a mound out of it then that's correct make a mound out of it and here in a few days as the carcass starts to compost and so on, this will probably shrink in size as it settles a little bit. So we'll probably add just a little bit more uh, to ensure that we have, uh, we have enough. Just to make sure we have enough. Right. And I guess it's important to note that you don't have to have a tractor to do it, but it does make it easier. It sure does make it a lot easier. <laughs> That's right, make it a lot faster. All right. One thing we want to do is to check the pile temperature. Okay. And to do that, we use a long stem uh, compost thermometer. Okay. And why are we concerned about temperature at this point? Well, if the bacteria are working, uh, they're going to be creating a lot of heat. This type of composting, it's really a static aerobic pile. We want aerobic microorganisms working or those that require oxygen. They generate quite a bit of heat. If the pile gets too wet, if it uh, packs down too much and there's no oxygen, anaerobic bacteria take over. Those are the ones that cause odors. Oh, okay. So those we definitely don't want. Aerobic bacteria, if they're working, they're going to get this pile up between 130 and 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And so above, hot. Yeah, that's correct. And above 131 degrees Fahrenheit is where pathogens get killed. So we certainly want to reach that type of temperature so we can kill any type of disease organisms that might, that might be present. Okay. And uh, this is our compost thermometer. You can see the, the uh, reading there. Up to 200, looks yeah, like. Yeah, we have some working ones. We can take a look at those later on. And we just put this into the core, and we'll check that here in three, four days. If this is built correctly, then that should be up to about the temperature okay. that we want. Now, should we cover this at all? For this type of pile, no, we wouldn't really need to cover this as long as it's going to shed rainwater. Now, we have another example of a bin over here, a wooden bin. Uh -huh. And that we've covered with a tarp because the wooden sides tend to trap rainwater, uh. gets that compost too wet, then we have the problems with anaerobic bacteria that I mentioned earlier. Now these thermometers can run anywhere 80 to 100, 120 dollars. A lot of small farmers may not want to do that. So one thing that we recommend that people who don't want to use a thermometer can do to check their pile temperature is just to insert a piece of metal, uh -huh. like a piece of rebar in there, and grab that end. Oh, that's warm. That's pretty hot. It is pretty hot. So at temperatures above 130 degrees, you can only hold this for really, you know, just a couple of seconds. So there are other ways to check the temperature. That's then. correct. Yeah, okay. That's right. How long will it work? How long will we need it to sit before we actually see the results? After you put a carcass in, after about uh, 10 weeks, 70, 75 days, 80 days or so, generally the temperature is going to start to decrease. Then you want to go in and turn that pile. You can use your bucket to kind of pick it up lift it up and just cascade it, dump it back down in. What that does, it helps aerate the pile, mm -hmm. mix the contents. Okay. After you stir it or turn it in that manner once, you know, ensure you have good covering layer, then let that sit for another couple of months and it should reheat 
again. Okay. And uh, we've had a pile that actually reheated to a higher temperature than it did initially. We had a pile get over 150 oh, degrees. Wow. Uh, if it gets 160 degrees or more, then the bacteria start to die off because it's too hot. But, uh, but up to that 150 that's point, correct. it's still working. That's correct. And most problems with compost piles, if it's not heating, if it's overheating, if it's too wet, generally if you open them up, aerate them, check the moisture, and close them back up and then you're going to get that pile working again. They're going to start again. And you have one over here that sure. uh, is already done? This was started I believe uh, in June, early June. It was turned in August and it's it's really done. It's just been sitting here. So can you can you use this uh, carbon material again or is it one and done and then what do you do with it? I guess spread it out amongst the field? Yes, the finished compost uh, can be, a portion of it can be reused because as you can see we use a fair amount of carbon source for even just a couple of carcasses. Right. So about half of this could be reused. You could make a 50-50 mixture of, of already compost material with new carbon source. That way you're kind of stretching your carbon source and it's a good use for it. Right. Other uses would uh, include you know, putting this on pasture. It's not recommended to put this on crops that are meant for direct human consumption and that's, that's okay. something that you can't do but uh, pasture land agricultural land is fine pretty much all that's left now are the bones i guess the remains yeah the bones and what happens with these larger bones what will happen with this is we would put this in a new pile uh -huh. and then just let this keep composting there are large bones that do remain. A lot of the smaller bones are just, you know, are just gone. But these you can see. Yeah, yeah. Well, it looks like an interesting process and uh, hopefully a lot of producers around here will find this useful and mm -hmm. a good way to take care of their animals if they, well, as we all know, we have these from time to time. That's, that's right. All right, that's thanks right. Roger, appreciate sure. it. Mm -hmm. Now, Josh, your study that you did was really similar to that, only using cattle. Mm -hmm. That's correct. We actually looked at three different treatments. One was pine shavings, one was a mixture of poultry litter and pine shavings, and the other was hay. And basically, we took four replications per treatment. Uh, we composted stalker calves weighing anywhere from 400 to 700 pounds over a five-month period and then looked at the results afterwards. Yeah, and, and what did you walk away with uh, after that was all done? Well, we found out that uh, the pine shavings and poultry litter treatments seemed to be the most effective. It reached high temperatures for effective pathogen kill and uh, it probably had the, it did have the best results on soft tissue decomposition as well as decomposing the bone. The end product they had, that we had was a dark humus-like uh, material and uh, that is something that we could use as a soil amendment as a fertilizer to land apply. Sure. Now, why, I guess, to sum it all up, why should a producer think about using composting as opposed to just dragging their animals out to a spot in their field like, the, like they probably have for years? Well, sustainable agriculture, uh, you are producing a viable byproduct that you can use as a soil amendment and you're also reducing disease transmission. I think those are three key points to composting your, your uh, livestock. All right, Josh, thanks for being here. It's good information. And I understand you'll be having an OSU fact sheet coming out in the next couple of months. <laughs>